We're continuing our study in the great truths of free grace. And we are considering the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. We're dealing with the facts of the spiritual life. The facts of the spiritual life. And I think I did it again. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Why do I do that all the time? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. How do we live out the spiritual life? We've looked at several different things. And we have a few more things to cover. But one of the great hindrances that happens to the believer uh, comes from human viewpoint thinking, satanic viewpoint thinking, worldly thinking, that is still in our minds. Remember, we want to build the soul fortress of Bible doctrine and fellowship with the Holy Spirit so that we can be secure uh, as far as our spiritual growth is concerned. We're not talking about eternal security. We're talking about spiritual advance. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3-5. through 5. Second. Uh, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. And those fortresses are the things that are in our mind that stand up against the Lord. Look what he says in verse 5. For we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We have looked so far at saying that there are many different ways in which Satan can get a foothold in our thinking. Uh, we think that we have the answer to things, and we think this is how the way the world works. We think this is the way we should expect things to be. And we discover that unless those are based upon Scripture, Bible doctrine, that they become, according to Ephesians 4.27, an occupied place in our thinking. That's what Paul is saying here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the idea of fortresses. Now last time, we gave the warning, if we do not destroy those fortresses, those ways of thinking that have not been conquered by the Scriptures, that ultimately they're going to destroy us. We have to deal with them now before they explode on us before they wind up destroying our life. Unintended consequences, unintended, unforeseen consequences will come. A decision that is made without depending on the Word, the word of God, with the result that eventually these things are going to bring painful destruction to our lives, often in time, but certainly in eternity. Every day we are faced with a multiplicity of decisions. The Word of God is to inform us about every decision, every response, everything that we do. Because if it doesn't, then those ways of thinking will result in something that we will not like. It will not be for our good. And we will come to regret not having applied doctrine when we should have. Now, in thinking about this, I thought here on Messianic Presentation to Israel Day, or Palm Sunday, and this is not in any of your notes, so you might want to jot some things down, that we have a perfect demonstration of the principle that unintended consequences can happen in our life if we do not believe the truth of the Word as it is given to us. In the time of Christ, he was doing everything he could by his work and by his words to demonstrate not only who he was as far as deity is concerned, but also that he was the promised Messiah of Israel, the one that they had been looking forward to for generations. However, because they had if you will, a fortress within their mind of wrong thinking about the Messiah. 
When they saw the Messiah and they were confronted with the fact that Jesus was there, he was the promised Messiah, he had fulfilled every prophecy, and by both his works and his words he was demonstrating who he was, they did not accept it because they fell back into their own way of thinking. With the result, as we're going to see, we're going to trace through some scriptures here in the book of Matthew, with the result that there were many unintended consequences. That at the time they were making the decision, listen to me, at the time they were making the decision, they could never have imagined that this was going to be the outcome. As a matter of fact, the decisions they made then, some 2,000 years ago, continue to negatively impact their descendants, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. Go to Matthew chapter 8. Follow along with me. We're just going to trace some things. Matthew chapter 8. And that's how it's Okay, let's talk about Matthew chapter 8. Go to chapter 12. I jotted some of these things down early this morning. I woke up at 1 o'clock. Chapter 12, beginning verse 22. Matthew chapter 12, verse 22. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus, and he healed him. So that the mute man spoke and saw. Now of all the times that there may have been healings within the Old Testament time frame, never had this been done. As a matter of fact, one of the Old Testament prophets predicted that it would be one of the sure signs of the Messiah that the blind would see and the deaf would speak. The mute would speak. The deaf would hear. But look at the leadership response. All the crowds were amazed and were saying, this cannot be the son of David, can he? Well, the son of David, the predicted Messiah. The people are saying, wait a minute. The only one who is ever going to do these type of miracles is the promised Messiah. Is this him? Now look at the leadership. But when the Pharisees heard this, now, the Pharisees were the ones that had in their mind exactly what the Messiah should be doing. By the way, one of the things the Messiah should be doing, according to their idea, is following their traditions and supporting them as the Pharisees, which Jesus did not do. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man casts out demons only by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. You see, what has happened here is that in spite of all of the miracles that Jesus was doing, they have reached this point where the, they have officially identified Jesus not as the Son of God, not as the promised Messiah, but rather a demon-possessed person. They attributed the works of God to the work of Satan. Now this becomes the official rejection of the Messiah by the leadership. They thought, we'll say it again, they thought this was the right thing to do. They thought that Jesus didn't live up to their expectations. They thought that Jesus was not who he claimed to be. Even though they had the Bible, even though they supposedly knew the Bible, they had covered the, the Scripture with their own thinking, their own traditions, their own ways of doing things. With the result, listen, that when the truth was presented to them, they were willfully blind. I will not see it. Not unlike people do today. Whenever you confront them with the truth of Scripture about some decision they're making in their life, they are willfully blind in saying, no, I'm not paying attention to that. I'm not going to do it 
that way. That's exactly what the Pharisees were doing. Go to chapter 21. And now we come down to the Messianic presentation. This is Palm Sunday. The day whenever Jesus presented himself to the Jews, fulfilling prophecy. So this is his official presentation to the nation that he is the Messiah. All the other things that he's done with the way that he spoke and what he taught and the things that he did with the miraculous and so forth were leading up to this point. The Jewish leaders had already said no. You're not the Christ. You're not the anointed one. You're not the Messiah. You're working according to Satan. Jesus nevertheless went to the people and fulfilled again the scriptures. Go to chapter 21, verse 1. When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethpage, the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying, Go to the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. That is Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. So what was he writing? He was writing in. Our, our picture up there shows him riding in on a donkey. doesn't show that the, the foal coming along with him, but it was. Perfectly fulfilling exactly the prophecy. Again, everything that he did was in accordance with what had been prophesied. These people at the time frame, they were looking for the Messiah. They were expecting a Messiah. But they were thinking wrong. And every time the people began to question, is this really the Messiah? The Pharisees would come down like a hammer and say, you don't know the Scriptures. Well, the people did know the Scriptures. But the Pharisees gave their interpretation and their tradition that canceled out the knowledge. Verse 6, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them and brought the donkey and the colt, laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road. And others were cutting branches. John 12, 13 tells us they were palms. That's why this is called Palm Sunday. From the trees and spreading them on the road. The crowds going ahead of them. And those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of God. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. They didn't say, This is the Messiah Jesus. This is the prophet Jesus. Go up to verse 15. Well, let's see. Go up to verse 14. And the blame and the... The blame. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them right in the heart of where the Pharisees were. One after the other is the significance of it. 15. But. Here is human viewpoint. Here is the fortresses. And it's going to bring them to a destination of unintended consequences that they never could have imagined. It was going to take them. But. When the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, and the children were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the Son of God, they became indignant. There's a lot of people get mad whenever you tell them the truth. A lot of people get real upset with it. Verse 16, and they said to him, Do you hear what these children are saying? In other words, you shouldn't be allowing this. We've already determined you're, you're doing these things by Satan. You're not the Messiah. Well, you have to agree with that. Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies? You have prepared praise for yourself. 
And he left them. Went out into the city to Bethany and spent the night there. Chapter 23. Now we come to a, another point on the, on the road. Jesus is now overlooking the city of Jerusalem. The city that God has established on planet Earth, or had established on planet Earth for the manifestation of His presence, had been that way for hundreds of years. The very place that was predicted in the Old Testament, that the Messiah was going to come and present himself. He's already done that. They said, no, you're demonic. This is, you're the work of Satan. We reject you. Not because he wasn't fulfilling the prophecy, but because of their false ways of thinking. So now Jesus, in a great heart of compassion, is overlooking Jerusalem. And he says in verse 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You can almost hear his voice breaking with tears. You kill the prophets and stone those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together. Like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were, what's the next word? Unwilling or not willing. Not you could not come. You were not willing to come. They were exercising their volition, their free will, to reject everything that he said, everything that he did, and the demonstration of the fulfillment of prophecy. Then he says, Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. The house being the temple of the Davidic kingdom. Now, let's just pause there. That's the unintended consequence. We often look at these things with our focus on Jesus, but in this thing today, I want us to look at the people, at the leaders. The unintended consequence that God knew was going to come was the destruction of Israel, the destruction of the temple. And that was going to last all the way through. Verse 39, for I tell you, from now on, you will not see me until you say, that is the leadership, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Do you know when that's going to happen? Zechariah 12, 10, at the end of the tribulation period. They still, as a nation, as leaders, they still have not accepted Jesus as their Messiah. What Jesus is saying, there is a series of unintended and unforeseen consequences that are coming because of the decisions you have made. Let's trace this on. Chapter uh, 26. And verse 4. Let's read 3 and 4. Twenty-six, three, and 4. Then the chief priests and the, and the elders of the people, this is the leadership, were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas, and they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. Now once again, I want you to consider that these people thought, and you can read on, and I don't have time to develop all this, but they really thought they were doing what was right. They really thought they were protecting the nation. Not because of anything Jesus had said and done, but because of their false ways of thinking that were planted in their brain that was preventing them, willingly preventing them from seeing the truth right in front of their eyes. With the result that now they were coming all the way down 
to say we're going to kill the Messiah. And it wasn't just the leadership. It became all the people. Go to chapter 27. Beginning in verse 19, Jesus is now before Pilate. He's already gone before the Sanhedrin. And there they have rejected him. He has told them clearly he is the Messiah. But they reject him. Then in verse, chapter 27, verse 20, but the chief priests and the elders. Notice how many times that keeps getting repeated. By the way, this is just a quick reminder for you. The goal of the, of the Gospel of Matthew is to answer a question. The question is, if Jesus was the Messiah, where is the kingdom? The reason why there is no Messianic kingdom yet is because the Jewish leadership rejected him and the people rejected him and they killed their Messiah. Now, in the plan of God, that killing of the Messiah also was the means whereby God the Father was fully satisfied with the sacrifice of the Son because on the cross, Jesus Christ died as our spiritual substitute, paid the full price for all the sins of mankind, paid your sin price. That's why you can't pay for your own sin, neither in time or eternity. It's already been paid for. Any person that thinks that by being a good person, somehow God's going to be impressed with you, simply does not understand the Scriptures. He's impressed with the work of His Son, Jesus Christ. But we're looking at unintended consequences. But the chief priests and the elders, verse 20, persuaded the crowds. Now the people are joining in. Sometimes people with wrong thinking can be very persuasive. If, listen, if we do not know the truth, we will be deceived. These people who were the leaders, who were the religious leaders, the political leaders, were deceiving the people. And because they themselves were not firmly grounded in the truth, because they themselves were not willing to stand against the tide of popular opinion and leadership opinion, they got swept up in it. Look what it says. The crowds to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. The governor said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Barabbas was a thief. Troublemaker. Our Barabbas. Verse 22. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? Stop. He knew what others were saying about him. The few were saying about him. He is the Christ. He is the anointed one. It's the Christ is the Greek word for Messiah, which is Hebrew, meaning the anointed one, the promised one who was to come, who had been anointed by God the Father to be the Messiah of Israel. And even at this point, I see that as an act of the grace of God. Reminding them who he is. Coming from the mouth of a Gentile unbeliever. They all said, Crucify him! Not just the leaders. The people. And he said, why? What evil has he done? Remember, all of the trials of Jesus were illegal except the one in front of Pilate. Pilate is the one who then came around and said, I find no fault in this man. And the only legal trial he was declared innocent. He said, what evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. You can almost hear the thundering noise within the halls of Pilate. Crucify him! Pilate himself was fearful because there was a lot of turmoil in Rome at the time. Some of the ones who were Pilate's best friends had been identified as traitors to the emperor, to Caesar. 
Pilate was fearful that he might get caught up in that. As a matter of fact, the Jews themselves told him at one point, if you do not crucify this man, you're no friend of Caesar. That got his attention. What were they saying? You must kill him or we're going to go be a tattletale on you. And you're going to be called to Rome and they're going to kill you. Pilate, instead of having the strength of character to stand up, to do what is right, instead, went along. Verse 24. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting. <laughs> a riot. Isn't it amazing? By the way, I'm watching this happen in the United States right now. People who are opposed to anything dealing with truth, one way they solve it is by rioting, by marching, by threatening. He was afraid a riot was going to get started because that would bring the attention to Rome. He was going to be in trouble. Look, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. Verse 25, we pay attention to this. And all the people said, His blood shall be on us and our children. Unintended consequences. They did not take it seriously. They thought they were just doing a political thing that they gave Pilate a, a way out to do what they wanted to do. Verse 26, And he released Barabbas for them, but after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Verse 33, And they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And they gave him wine to drink, Mixed with gall. And after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. Why? Because it would deaden the pain. Numb his thinking. He was there to experience the full suffering of mankind for us. He didn't go and run to the doctor and get a pain pill. 35. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And above his head, they put up a charge against him which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. We read another passage. The Jews even complained about that. Don't say he's the king of the Jews. Say he said he was the king of the Jews. Pilate said, I've written what I've written. He, uh, he finally got a little courage. Verse 38. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads. Who were the ones walking by hurling abuse? The Jews. The Jewish people. Now I want you to notice something here very clearly, beloved. Who is guilty of the crucifixion of Jesus? We all are. We all are. It's a sad mistake when throughout church history people call Jews the Christ killers. It was the Romans that nailed him. And the Romans are us. We're all guilty. By the way, by our sin, we are guilty. Mm -hmm. yes. Best saying, does he still fill the nails every time I fail? Mm -hmm. Sharon talked or sang on the Via Della Rosa on the way to Calvary. For you. For me. Let's go on. Verse 40, look what they're saying. You are... You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself. You see, they missed the fact that Jesus was referring to things metaphorically. He was going to rise again in three days. He was speaking of the temple of his body. But because they were unwilling to listen, they didn't hear the truth. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Listen to me. There's so many times that we think that if God was really God, He would act in a certain way, and 
the way that God's going to act is the way that I think He ought to act. Here's the problem. Especially, especially whenever we are dealing with suffering or someone we love is dealing with suffering, we forget the cross comes before the crowd. Suffering before reward. You see, why did God, could God have just, could Jesus have just come off the cross? Could Jesus have just, remember, we find in other places that he was sustained the universe. The only reason why those very people still had breath in their nostrils and a pulse in their, in, in their veins is because he was sustaining life while well, he hung on the cross. He could have, could have, could have, could have just said, that's it. And everything would have blinked out of existence. Why didn't he? Why didn't God the Father reach down and pinch our heads off? Listen to me. Because it was in the plan of God for the suffering to happen. Lord. Whenever we're going through what we are going through, both now or in the future, if we forget the principle that God is God and we're not, and we forget that God can take suffering and turn it into the crown because it is His plan for us, if we forget that, then we'll begin to develop false ideas. We'll begin to judge God from the middle of our circumstances rather than judging our circumstances from the vantage point of God. And we will begin to think false thinking very similar thinking to put Christ on the cross. It's up to us to apply Bible doctrine. That's what this is about. Let's read on. 41. In the same, in the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders. You see, it was the common people who were saying verse 40, and he makes a distinction in verse 41, were mocking him and saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. <laughs> Do you think that they had a clue that 
that 37 years later this was going to happen? You see, God always gives grace before judgment. He gave 37 years of grace for people to believe in Him. But when we reject the truth of the Word of God in our daily life, listen to me, young people, old people alike, when you reject and I reject the Word of God from my life, consequences are going to come. Both in time and eternity. They may not come immediately. But listen to me. You young people especially, I want you to hear me. The decisions you make now, you may think it's no big deal, and then you're getting along just fine. And it may be when you're in your 40s and 50s that suddenly it gets, hits you like a ton of bricks. And now there's nothing you can do about it. You make the right decisions now. And that applies to every one of us. Because you see, not only was what happened in 70 AD with the pogroms, all of the attacks against Jews that have happened throughout history, the Holocaust, the Muslims today, and the tribulation yet to come, all is this culmination of false thinking that they did not deal with. And it gave them unintended consequences. Because the Jewish leaders and the people did not believe in Jesus by accepting Him as their promised Messiah. They ended up in total destruction as the nation. And even though they have a nation today, that nation is still there only because of the help of the Gentile nations. And eventually it's going to happen again because of the Antichrist. We're looking at that in Revelation 12 and 13 right now. How do you avoid unintended consequences? We're going to have to pick up there next time. But let me make it simple for you. There's two things we have to do not to have unexpected, unintended consequences in our lives. One, we build the soul fortress of doctrine and we keep in fellowship. You've got to learn the word, learn the doctrine, learn to be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. But secondly, and more difficult in many ways, to tear down false thinking. Because if we don't, it may not happen right away, but it does have consequences. And it will hurt us, both in time and eternity. And beloved, listen to me and I'm done. The greatest pain that's going to come to many of us is because we did not learn and follow the Word when we stand before our Savior because we did believe in Him for eternal life. We're going to see unintended consequences. I don't know one believer that has ever said, I want to live in such a way that when I stand before the Lord, I'm going to be ashamed. I want to live in such a way that I want to experience the outer darkness. I'm going to live in such a way that, that I'm going to lose all my rewards. Now, I've heard a few fools that say, I don't really want to get saved. I want to be in hell with all my friends. Stupid. <laughs> You're not hanging out with your friends in hell, drinking your beer, smoking the weed, having a good time. You're in torment forever. Matter of fact, it's blackness of blackness. And if I understand the scripture correctly, you won't even see anybody. All eternity, you're alone. The only way to avoid that consequence is to believe in Jesus alone for eternal life. That's the way out. But we can resist that. We can apply our own thinking. Like I had a person told me once when I was talking to him, he said, well, I can't really believe all that because, you know, we just evolved from earlier forms of life. Really? Now, I eventually got him to the point where he believed in Jesus for eternal life, but it took a while. You can continue to believe what you want to believe, but you, listen, you cannot determine the consequences. They have already been said. Just as Jesus looked over Jerusalem and said, destruction is coming until you do this. It applies to us. Believers, it applies to us. If we don't get serious about the Word of God, 
There's things that are going to happen, but you're not going to want to happen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this time around your word. For the beauty of knowing that you love us so much that even while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, died for us. That we might live in him. That we could have eternal life. He who believes in me has everlasting life. That Jesus, because you are the Son of God, because you are the eternal God, come in human flesh. Because you did go to the cross after living a perfect life in time. Because there, God the Father laid the sins of the whole world upon you. Paying the, pay, and you paid our full sin debt penalty. And then rose again. And we'll celebrate next week. Because of that, we can have eternal life by simply believing your promise. Just to allow ourselves to be convinced that that promise is true. You died for us. You rose again. Now you offer us a free gift. For by grace you are saved through faith and not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works lest anyone should boast. Father, I pray if there is any here on the internet who are listening that have never allowed themselves to believe in Jesus for eternal life. That today they will affirm its truth. And they'll be the recipients of eternal life. But Father, as believers, we too have got to guard how we think about your word. Because of unintended consequences that will come. Just as it happened at the time of Christ with the Jewish people as we have looked at today. So it can also happen in the destruction of our lives. Both in time and eternity. I pray that we will gain a new determination to learn and follow your word. For it's in the name of Jesus that we give you praise. Amen.